Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, two uses to the umbrella in Edinburgh. Good evening. Welcome to the eighth ECAS conference here in the beautiful city of Edinburgh. My name is Tom Maloney. I'm director of the Center of African Studies here at the University of Edinburgh and convener of the conference. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Amanda Hammer, who is the president of Aegis. Please, Amanda. Hi. Good evening, everybody. My name is Amanda Hammer. I'm at the Center of African Studies in Copenhagen University, and I'm just newly arrived as the president of Aegis, which is a great honor for me. But equally, it's a really deep honor to be in the position to welcome all of you, fellow Africanists from many corners of the globe, to the eighth biennial conference of the European African Studies Association. Um, just as an aside, I acknowledge here that Aegis, which is the name the shortened name of the association, nice catchy name, um, nice catchy acronym, but it belies a much more complicated name which we don't usually use, the Africa Europe Group for International Studies. So let's just stay with Aegis for now. Um, ECAS, the European Conference of African Studies, is a core pillar of Aegis alongside our growing number of thematic collaborative research groups, CRGs, and if you haven't heard of them yet, they're on the Aegis website, they're visible in, in many of the panels here. So together also with a, a biennial PhD summer school that leads up to each Aegis uh, ECAS conference, as well as a dedicated Aegis series, book series in, the, in Brill, with Brill. So the large size of ECAS, which is by now the largest gav gathering of Africanists outside of Africa, is a testament to the dynamism and robustness of African studies, both within Europe and far and wide. And the amazingly rich and diverse panels and papers here is just one illustration of, of this um, dynamism and robustness. Um, the interest of so many researchers from Africa and elsewhere to come and participate in Aegis stroke ECAS conferences is a great compliment to us um, in, in Aegis, in U European African Studies, and we both thank you immensely and for making such an effort to be here. Some have had to make a great effort. We know the visa story. Um, and we very, very warmly welcome you. We're also very much aware that conferences of this size take immense dedication, time, and hard work by the very many people, both up front and behind the scenes. So to begin with, I'd especially like to thank the team at the Center of African Studies, Tom Maloney, Paul Nugent, and a great many others for all the work they've put into organizing this year's wonderful program. They're strongly supported by Rohan Jackson and his conference organizing team at Nomad IT. Besides that, behind the scenes, of course, although some feel the effects of it, are all the reviewers of panels, papers, and the dedicated scientific committee um, that have managed the program itself and the ins and outs of that program. To all the administration and catering staff throughout the University of Edinburgh, we thank you, and over 80 very generous and helpful volunteers, mostly from students from across European universities. We really thank everybody. So may we please thank everybody by hand with an applause. And of course, I'd really like to thank, on behalf of Aegis, all of those who have, all of you who've initiated panels, prepared papers, and shown up to evoke and engage in the exciting conversations that this conference facilitates. As I've said elsewhere in the past few days, I see African studies as an important collective political intellectual project, which, to quote Paul Zeleza, proposes that we must ensure a continued struggle for the production, organization, dissemination, and consumption of knowledges that enhance rather than undermine Africa's possibilities. More than the study of Africa and Africa in the world, it is African studies is a conscious and for very many of us conscientious project of rethinking the world, rethinking history, rethinking theory, and rethinking the future through Africa. So I'm really proud to be part of a collective enterprise that is I'm assuming dedicated to this. So with that, again, a very warm welcome and enjoy ECAS 8.
thank you, Amanda. Okay, I'll keep myself uh, brief now. Um, my words about the conference, including my thanks to the many people who have been involved to arrange this event, uh, will come at the handover on Friday afternoon. I have three brief announcements for now. The, the first one is one of our volunteers misplaced her mobile phone in one of the conference bags, um, which was handed over to a delegate. So if, if you thought we were very generous by giving a brown LG phone, um, we weren't. If you could please hand that to one of the volunteers in, in a yellow t-shirt, please. Um, the, a brown LG phone, if you might have found that in the goodie bag. Um, secondly, this relates to uh, publishers who have their books on display. Um, many of them have come a long way with a large number of books, and they're, of course, keen to have your custom. Um, this morning, I visited all of the, the publishers' venues. Uh, my favorite was in the Potter Row building. Uh, it's a quieter venue. It's a good place to have meetings, to relax, to have tea. And from my experience, the concourse of this building were in the, the McEwen Hall and the Potter Row building. They're prime locations for that. If your panels are in the Crystal Macmillan building, that's the CMB, uh, or 50 George Square, please head to the McEwen Hall concourse here or the Pottero building for refreshments. If you're in the Gordon Aikman Lecture Theatre, um, head to David Hume Tower. If you're in David Hume or, or the Appleton Tower, there are, there are refreshments there, of course. If it gets too busy, uh, please head to the other venues such as this, McEwen Hall or Potter Row Building. And that way the, the publishers should get maximum footfall and um, there'll be fewer bo bo bottlenecks at the busier times. And finally, after this event at 1930, there's a welcome drinks reception at the National Museum of Scotland. The map is in the front page of the conference book, which shows this venue, which is the McEwen Hall. At the northwest, the top left-hand corner, is an arrow for the National Museum of Scotland. Where the arrow is is pretty much where the National Museum is. It's about three minutes from here. At the end of this event, there should be people with yellow t-shirts, um, maybe under umbrellas and under cagoules and anoraks, um, pointing people towards the National Museum, where you're all, you're all welcome um, for a drink and some, some nibbles, some bitings. Um, one last thing is please uh, put your phones to silent. And now, without further ado, we, we turn to the opening keynote event, and I'm delighted to introduce Professor Mamadou Diouf, Leitner Family Professor of African Studies and History, and Chair of the Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies Department at Columbia University. Professor Diouf holds a PhD from the University of Paris Sorbonne. Before joining the faculty at Columbia University, he was the Charles D. Moody Jr. Collegiate Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Michigan from 2000 to 2007. He has worked extensively on the history of 19th and 20th century Senegal, including a history of the Kajor Kingdom in the 19th century and an edited collection published in 2013 on tolerance, democracy, and Sufis in Senegal. He's also worked on migration in the city and the production of academic knowledge in Africa. This evening, Professor Diouf will be giving a paper entitled Black Atlantic Horizons and the Practices of History, Histories of Dismembering and Remembering. He'll speak for around 45 minutes with the remaining time for question and answers. So please join me in welcoming Professor Diouf. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Tom, for your generous introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me. I have to confess that I was really happy to come at Edinburgh for one reason. I have been reading and teaching for more, almost more than 20 years one of the most, probably most popular historian of the University of Edinburgh. And coming here and discovering that he was still alive made me quite, uh, it's Professor George Shepherson. He's the one who invented in 1965 the term African diaspora. 
at the first conference of African historians in Dar es Salaam. And I would like to dedicate this presentation to him. Uh, my presentation is on how the diverse and sometimes competing intellectual traditions attached to the imagined and diverse communities of black people have been brought together in the early 20th century by black intellectual and activists to address the effect of the Atlantic slave trade and what Mudimbe calls the colonizing structure on their presence on the world stage. A presence defined by racially based political disenfranchisement, economic dispossession, exploitation and colonization that affected their presence in history. It's also interrogate the recurring themes, concept, theory and practices circulating in academic research and popular debate during the last three to four decades, generating debates and controversies, globalization, cosmopolitanism, but also modernity and identity. Concept Fred Cooper actually qualified as conflicting polysemic concept in his paper, What is the Concept of Globalization Good For? An African Historian's Perspective. It's also what William Wan Chandel, a Dutch historian of, of, of Bangladesh, uh, discusses in what he called the imaginary of a broader world, heavily dependent on the geometries of power that determines one's place. And he uses, and this concept is important about the notion of, of connection, uh, what he called rescaling, rescaling in relation to the framework within which we have been operating as social, as social, as social scientists. Van Chandel observed that today, the important issues no longer seems to be the search for the cultural grammar of South Asia, the essence of Islamic civilization, or the spirits of Asia. If I want to bring into the discussion Africa, I will refer to my colleague, uh, Megan Vaughan, who in her discussion with actually the use of a subaltern studies concept by, 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 by Africanists was trying also to define a kind of specificity of Africa in relation to the subaltern concept by saying that African studies should be actually uh, influenced more by the invention of tradition, that what define Africa as a specific space is the notion of, 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 of invention of tradition, which is, uh, you know, the theories which are uh, deriving from the work of, 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 of Terence Range. So what our Van Schandel is pointing at is how the shift has happened from the search of autonomous territories for specific area studies to the search of decompartmentalizing our, our field. And the notion of connection, in particular among historians, is deriving from that. Such essentialist inquiry, he pursues, do not sit easily with a fascination with hybridity, transnationalism, and global transformation that has animated so many recent research projects of prevailing regional scheme and visualizing discontinuities 
region that might take the special form of latest archipelagos, holorings, or patchwork. The friction of distance is much less than it used to be. Capital flow has a result, as much as human migration has rapidly created and recreated profound connection between distance plays. As a result, some of the most powerful social spatial aggregation of our day simply cannot be mapped as single bound territories. The geography of social life in the late 19th century has outgrown not only the contour of post-war map, but also the very convention by which we represent spatial pattern in images and text. And this is a quote from his paper, Geographies of Knowing, Geographies of Ignorance, Jumping Scales in Southeast Asia. Global historical perspective everywhere tend to gravitate between two poles uh, of perspective based on power differential across time and historical connectivity. At one extreme, societies are viewed as having been forced into global relation, acting upon having the world thrust upon them, or at the other extreme, societies have reached out and forged such relationship and become part of the larger historical narrative. And thus, in historical term, is a world actor. And the idea of actor is very important in relation to, again, the situating of Africa in the global stage. Associated to those master concepts are ideas which are now central of circulation, connection, interaction, integration. The various goals of the new conception have been to break down the very effect of history as it constituted itself as a science in the 19th century. The science of political affair, the political affair of the nation. And this is very important to keep in mind if you want to understand how you know, the idea of connection is today so important for historians. The fact that history is the science of the nation. And the way it was defined as a science of a nation actually was, uh, uh, if you want, systematized by, by, by Hegel. But my, my, my understanding of reading of history has been heavily influenced by Ranajit Guha, an Indian historian who had published in particular an important, very important booklet uh, titled History at the Limit of world history. And uh, in that book, what he's basically trying to do is to read history from a Western perspective based on actually an interpretation in particular of Hegel. Hegel who has coined the term of world history. And what he's basically interested in is, you know, what history would look like if it's, it is written at the limit of world history. What he called the limit is of world history is outside Hegel's understanding of history as the science of the nation, as the science of the states. Because this construction is first a teleological construction, which look at history through a series of successive advents that culminate with the Christian God. 
actually. And in his reading of history, uh, Hegel paid more attention or heavily attention to the state and the role of the state in civilizing a society and making it a rational society. Hegel's design of world history, according to Guha, became the justification of European expansion, the colonization of continents, and the wholesale destruction of entire cultures. World history became the record of state and empire, great men, and clashing civilization. It constituted the centers in Europe and peripheries in the non-European world, and a linear historical framework molded exclusively by the political affair. World history, unitarian and authoritarian reason, of course, we have a capital R, and this uh, uh, terminology is borrowed from Sheldon Pollock, who is a Sand Critist, who has published a very, very important paper titled The Ends of Man and the End of Post and the End of Premodernity, where he is comparing uh, the end of premodernity in Europe and India. And in his qualification of a Western reason, which according to him, try or to radically eradicate everything outside its narrative or to submit it by dismissing everything as pre-modern or pre-history. In my presentation, I approach uh, the question of connected history through a different yet familiar site, Africa and its diaspora, asking Guha's radical interrogation. What history practice at the limit outside of world history would look like? Guha's uh, answer is simple, referring to Tagore, who said that the only way to write history outside the West is to forget political history and write the history of everyday life. The wonder, as he puts it, of everyday life. Of course, he's intervention, his answer is the answer of a poet, a poet who usually don't believe or dismiss historians because of their very different way of telling and talking about, uh, about the past. So why did I actually select such, such a perspective? It's for basically three reasons. The first reason is about the imagining of black as a country. Black people did not have, in the early 20th century, a nation, a state of a territory. But their identity was defined by the color of their skin. The complexion of color proposed a space, a space to imagine the past, to imagine the present, and to imagine the future. So for black people, if you want the imagining, uh, the, the thinking about the nation in a period which is a period of nationalism, the 19th century is mostly a moment of imagining. It's about imagination, which is still the case today. 
Africa is imagined in different parts of the world. And this multiple imagination is what is creating this object, which is called Africa. And it's what is changing the different perception of the continent. And it, it's what had been the main concern of black intellectuals in the early 20th century. It's the way in which they were part of a discussion which was larger than themselves. But they lacked one thing, which was the main resource of the nationalist discussion, a territory. So imagination allowed them to actually create it. Imagination through art, imagination philo through philosophical engagement with the Enlightenment reason. Imagination through kinestic practice, the practice of dance. And it's why dancing became so important for them. Dancing has expressing a relation to the land, a relation to the soil, a soil which they did not control, they, but at the same time, which they were able to act on. And this is where probably the idea of connection becomes important. When, as scholars today, we are fascinated by that, what I'm contending in my presentation is black intellectual has always been looking for connection because they were excluded from history for not being connected. It's why the language they use resonates very well with the language we are using today. The problem is why are they absent from the literature? Because they are not there. Du Bois has predicted that by saying that African studies in the late 18th and early 20th century was not an academic field. It was an activist field. It was blacks, black priests, black pastors who were investing in writing the history of Africa. He predicted that the day African study will become an academic field, blacks will be kicked out of the discipline. And it's what has happened. It's changing today, I have to confess. But it's what has happened in the early phase. I have also to confess that you know, when actually the discussion about African history in the 60s was reopened, you had the same discussion. African Americans were excluded by European Africanists and African Africanists, being accused of doing activism, not science. This is also very important if we try to understand the discussion about connection and disconnection. So the imagining is important. Is why in my presentation you will notice I will mention more creative writers than historians or, 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 or social scientists because I think that they actually reveal much more the tensions which have actually fed the discussion about black identity and about black presence in the world scene. The second reason I have to invoke is the intriguing relationship between our new academic practice and the black elite engagement with history and with the world, in particular the slave trades, European expansion, and the dispersal of black people in the early 20th century. 
The third is the production of an African library. I'm borrowing from Mudimbe that has always been concerned with connection, disconnection, interdependency, dependency, regions, continent, race, but also assimilation, integration, segregation, inclusion, and exclusion. And for me, this engagement with the world is an engagement we can understand has the making or the imagining of global Africa. An Africa which is not the dark continent in relation, of course, to the Enlightenment. Europe is what is with the light and the dark continent. And this is the radical exclusion of Africa from history and from the universal. But it's why engaging with that binary cons uh, construction of enlightenment and obscurity is uh, critical to understand, actually, uh, and back to that, the idea of global Africa. And, and the notion of global Africa, if you want, was invented by Jean Nardal. The uh, Nardal sisters, who are uh, Martinican, uh, have played a central role in uh, the Negritude movement. They are the first Francophones who were interested in translating the Harlem Renaissance writers. In particular, uh, the book published in 1925 by Alain Locke, The New Negro. And The New Negro uh, has played a critical role in what we can call black modernity. It's the book which actually crystallized, if you want, the philosophical uh, understanding of, 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 of the new Negro. So Jane used uh, 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 the internationalism noir, black internationalism, in a paper she published in 1928 in the Depeche African. And if you want to understand actually her approach, we, we have to think precisely about the space in which she was intervening, France, but about also the relationship which has been developing in particular between the Francophone community a community he calls the, the uh, Afro-Latin and the Anglo-Saxon community, and the way in which the two actually group interacted. is why when we talk about connection, we have to pay attention also to the way in which African-Americans uh, African diasporic community has tried to define their relationship with Africa, bearing in mind one very important thing. They are marginalized basically because they are connected to Africa. They are connected to the dark continent. So there, if you want, emancipation was conditioned by actually uh, being able to argue that Africa was a civilized place. It was the condition sine qua non to repeat Senghor that they could be accepted as full Americans. So that relationship uh, is important. But it's also important to show, if you want, in a very, very, very convincing way, uh, if you want, uh, 
the elements, which are the elements participating in basically showing that Africa is actually civilized. And the basic condition was the possibility of actually producing a story. Not history, but histories. And this is an important, uh, uh, if you want, uh, an important distinction to make. And uh, uh, to do it, I would like to refer to a talk which was given by the Nigerian novelist, Shimamanda Adichie, on the danger of a single story. What I have said about Africa is one single story, which is the story of the Western understanding of Africa. And Shimamanda writes, stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. And what she's basically saying was the practice of these early uh, historians and early anthropologists coming up with an histories to debunk universal history. And coming up with histories history, stories to redefine the practice of history and the geography of sites of civilization, of sites of, sites of culture. And it's why, again, coming back to connection and disconnection is so important if we want to understand actually ways in which those historians, those quote unquote African American and African social scientists of the early 20th century have actually uh, written against world history in, if you want, a move which is a move which we can define as race vindication, because it is about that. Is it about the definition, if you want, of racially, uh, racial cultures and the way in which they did play a role? And what is important in this discussion is precisely to actually compare ways in which in different places black intellectual has tried to address the issue of race vindication. And in his discussion of that M.S. Césaire, in particular in the discourse on colonialism, right, that being settled, I admit that it is a good thing to place different civilization in contact with each other that it is an excellent thing to blend different world, that whatever its own particular genius may be, a civilization that withdraws into itself atrophies, that for civilization, exchange is oxygen, that the great good fortune of Europe is to have been a crossroad, that because of it was the locus of all ideas, the receptacle of all philosophies, the meeting place of all settlement. It was the best center for redistributing, redistribution of energy. 
But when I ask the following question, has colonization really placed civilization in contact? Or if you prefer of all the ways of establishing contact, was it the best? I answer no. Following Césaire, who painstakingly draws up the indictment of an indefensible Europe, Leopold Sedar Senghor reviews the devices and resources that at the rendezvous du donner du recevoir, which is the give and take meeting, feed the civilization of the universal Negritude, which is the humanism of the 21st century, according to Senghor, strongly contributes to the cultural symbiosis of humanity, what Senghor called the metissage, the metissage cultural, to pronounce the complementarity of culture and civilization. Our concern has been, he writes, to assume that this negritude by living it and having experienced it to deepen its meaning, to present it to the world as a cornerstone in the fabricating of the universal. Civilization which will be the common work of all race and of all civilization or will not be. He continues strongly reaffirming the civilizing vocation of Africa and of the black people. Our vocation, our vocation he writes, of colonized, of colonized people is to overcome the contradiction of the conjuncture, the autonomy, the antinomy of artificially erected between Africa and Europe, our heredity, and our education. It is from my graft of it on that one that our freedom must be born. Superiority precisely, liberty of education is from, uh, uh, liberty of the metis who chooses where he wants, what he wants to reconcile various element and exquisite and strong work. This is exactly how destiny has met us. And again, this approach of negritude, which seems to be an essentialist approach to black identity, is actually a philosophy of contact. A philosophy which insists on three parameters. One of metissage, hybridity, Second, of exchanged, a civilization which is not interacting is a dead civilization. And third, of renovating the human. And this idea of renovating the human is central. Césaire writes that colonization did not only de-civilize the colonized, it also decivilized the colonizer. And his dialectic enabled him to actually profess the very fact that the decivilized colonizer is the only one who can save humanity. Because it's not about the identity of a black community, it's about uh, addressing the very crisis, which is the crisis of the human. And it's interesting to see that. They use a term which is very difficult to translate in English, what they call la condition humaine. You can translate it human condition. But it's very different from the philosophical idea behind it used. But also the practical one. When Senghor created his party, in, in, in the early 1950s, he will call 
the journal, which is quite amazing, the journal of his party, he will call it la condition humaine. You know, and you have to imagine that in, in a country 90 per, or 90% of the people are totally illiterate. But even the literate people will have problem understanding what he's trying to, to say with such, or to say with, with, with such a name. And we, but this discussion is important because uh, what Césaire and Senghor are singing is what I call the emergence of the integral man, a reborn man connected to multiple culture and civilization. And again, if we compare with what historians practicing connected history are doing today, this is exactly what the Negro people are, were doing, which is connecting different geographies, connecting different cultures. And to show you that, I would like to read you know, an extract of a poem by Senghor, uh, which is an extract of his uh, uh, collection, Chant d'Ombre, Shadow Song. And this is my translation, but I think that I probably need to read it in French first, because it's nicer. Que répondions présent à la renaissance du monde, ainsi le levain qui est nécessaire à la farine branche, car qui apprendrait le rythme au monde des fins, des machines et des canons, qui poussera le cri de joie pour réveiller les morts et orphelins de l'aurore, dit qui rendrait la mémoire de vie à l'homme aux espoirs éventrés. Ils nous disent les hommes du coton, du café, de l'huile. Ils nous disent les hommes de la mort. Nous sommes les hommes de la danse, dont les pieds reprennent vigueur en frappant le sol dur. And I think that this poem reflects, if you want, this discussion we are having. The discussion about location in the world, the discussion about identity, the discussion about culture, the discussion about segregation, the discussion about integration, the discussion about difference. So my translation that we respond present to the rebirth of the world, like the leaven that is needed for white flour. We would lead the rhythm to the dead world of machine and guns, who will utter the cry of joy to awaken the dead and orphan of the down. Say it, who will give back the memory of life to a man with the eviscerated hopes. They tell us men of cotton, coffee, oil. They tell us men of death, who are the men of the dance, whose feet take again force while striking the hard ground. Of course, Senghor speaks of men, never of women. But his idea of man is a kind of French idea. Homme is not neutral in French, it seems. Uh, I, I don't think that is true, but it's. So this, this search of, 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 of one connection is a search which actually is not, if you want, limited to visiting libraries and museums is also a direct search, a search of contact, people who are traveling. And people who not only are traveling, but are, are exchanging ideas. This is a period in the early 20th century where everything written in French by a black person is translated in English, is translated in Spanish, 
is translated in Portuguese. You have a kind of public space, which is the public space of a dispersed community which still think of itself as one, which is still thinks of itself as living in a territory which it is, of course, an imagined territory. So in this paper, what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do is precisely to look at the way in which many of these leaders who had traveled, who has been in contact with others in different countries, has tried actually to make sense of both their location in a specific space and their interaction with actually members of these, uh, these uh, members of a community, which is a community of black people. O of course, I can actually cite many of them, Blyden, Delaney, Wood, Du Bois, Langson Hughes, Claude McKay, Richard Wright, Eslanda Robinson, Robson. And Eslanda for me is very important because uh, she, she is usually referred to as the wife of Paul Robson. But he has played a critical role in, in understanding connection and disconnection. He has written extensively in those issues. And he had been in contact with the most important leaders of this period, not only African, not only African-American, but he has been uh, interested in particularly heavily by India, has befriended Nehru, has interviewed Gandhi, has visited Africa in 1936, written a book, on her visit in 1945. So Eslanda has, I think, uh, played an important role in precisely this uh, discussing, uh, discussing the, 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 the connection. Of course, I could talk also about, uh, you know, Du Bois. Uh, du Bois is, is very important because he devoted himself to correcting precisely the historical narrative. And his search of Africa, to use Manchu Javara's title, uh, you know, through which he interrogated the archaeology of the formation of the idea of Africa and the discursive and iconographic of Africans and blacks is critical in, this, in our discussion. And, and, and Du Bois has, if you want, among his many books, written the first monograph in African history in 1915, which is called The Negro. And it's a book which is critical in, again, the discussion about African history. It never mentioned or it's very rarely mentioned in the discussion on, uh, about the beginning of, of, of African history. And he begins his book, say, at once, talking about Africa, at once the most romantic and the most tragic of a continent. It is the Ethiopia of the Greek, the Kush and Punt of the Egyptian, and the Arabian land of the blacks. To modern Europe, it is the dark continent and a land of contrast. In literature, it is the site of the Sphinx and of the Lotus Eaters, the home of dwarfs, yomes, and pixies, and the refuges of gods. In commerce, it is the slave mart and the source of ivory, ebony, rubber gold and diamond. 
what other continent can rival interest this ancient day. And what is interesting is the way in which by actually connecting Africa, not only to different geographies and time, but to, to different interests. Du Bois is connecting, Du Bois is connecting the continent to a history which is not the history of the dark continent, but a history which is the history of a player, of a player of, uh, in African, in, in, in African. And the, the, the interest, if you want, in discussing Du Bois is the way in which his main concern was a concern of connection, a concern of connection that allows him to revise history and the writing of history. So I also contend that the intervention of black intellectual in the early uh, 20th century is not only about, if you want, rewriting African history. It is about revising the writing history. It's about the politics of history. And it's about presenting alternative way of alternative way of, 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 of right, alternative ways of writing history. And as I say, uh, Du Bois could be compared to Eslanda and the interest of Eslanda. And Eslanda Robson interest was about, uh, you know, in the age, the, the, 19th, the interwar period, in the age of imperialism and anti-imperialism, she was interested in opening up a space of connection, a space of solidarity. And again here, what is very interesting, when you read today Eslanda Robinson, her discussion about Indian politics, her discussion about what is happening in Indonesia, he writes a wonderful piece on the Bandung Conference presenting the presence of conservative American, African-American, like uh, uh, Adam Clayton Powell, and showing that actually it was not only radicals, African-American who were anti-colonialists. You had also very conservative African-American who were still anti-colonial. And this is very interesting because this discussion reminds us of a discussion which is going on about the global south. And this discussion about the global south, we see it also when we read uh, uh, Claude McKay. McKay who has played a critical role in actually uh, influencing the negritude movement. But McKay, who was much more interested in writing about what we can call, uh, you know, mobile, masterless people. Banjo is about this band of musicians, dockers who are working and living in Marseille. It's about people who are moving in the Mediterranean region. It's about people who are spreading rumors about, you know, politics, about engagement. It's all these people who had been part and very active in the discussion about Marxism, communism, socialism people who were Trotskites, you know, Bakuninis, etc., and who were still thinking about what was going on outside of their own black world, but who knew exactly what was at stake. McKay lived in Moscow from 1922 to 1923. When he left Moscow, he began writing 
against the Soviets. And one thing which is interesting is anticipation that Stalin was creating an authoritarian rule, that communism was unable, according to him, to understand race. But also the communist propaganda was a propaganda which was detrimental to, to blacks. So this is also about reading connection, about understanding international relation. And this is also an interesting element for historians because when we read these, in, these uh, black intellectual of the early 20th century, we see quite clearly why actually the non-understanding of, of or the contribution of black intellectual have had this effect on our understanding of international relation, but also on our understanding of, of, of connection, regional histories. Uh, because again, if we refer to uh, Trio's book, Silencing the Past, where he mentioned that in his magnum opus on, you know, the age of revolution, Eric Obsbaum devote only three lines to the Haitian Revolution. When again in 1915, in the Negro, Du Bois uses the term the age of revolution. Today, any, including me, when I refer to the term, of course it's Obsbaum. Du Bois used it, and used it in the same way it is used by Obsbaum. And what he was interested in is how the Haitian Revolution has changed, actually, the whole economic, political, and social setting of the Atlantic. Uh, and social setting of the Atlantic. So this is also things which are, which are important to, to keep in mind in this discussion. So I'm going to wrap up and propose a kind of conclusion which could allow us to continue this, this discussion. And of course, I discuss only African American. I could have, I am in a position to discuss also Africans who participated in this debate, in particular, Casely F. Effort, the, Niger, uh, the Gold Coast lawyer who had uh, played an important role in this discussion. And his fascination, in particular, for Japan and the importance of Japan in the discussion about emancipation and about nation building. So, and this discussion was also framed in the notion, which is the notion of the African Renaissance, which was the obsession at the heart of the black community reflection from the African Americans, and I can cite many names. But with the end of the Second World War, a new chapter opened. Global Africa dissipated and then definitely vanished, leaving the space for a discursive field and type of political mobilization nourished by anti-colonial and nationalist struggle in Africa and the struggle for civil rights in the diaspora. Several factors contributed to the progressive erosion of global Africa, including the multiple fracture within radical organization, personal dispute, and in particular, the rise of liberal organization, which in the Cold War context found fertile ground. All those factors contributed 
to the crumbling of internationalist engagement and the ebbing of the primary idea that sustain that engagement, that of an Africa that is global in its many theorization and practices. The effect of the Second World War and the Cold War in particular brought the interwar moment to a close with it the African presence in world history. The ebbing of Pan-Africa and its diverse form, formulation and manifestation accelerated civil right movement, favored integration and a conclusion that unified struggle to build black power. African struggle for decolonization withdrew into the space of colonial territory, promoting a nationalism founded upon the balkanization of Africa to employ Senghor character, characterization and took on unprecedented importance and size. I try to show that blacks and Africans have always, at least since the beginning of the 20th century, engaged in a project which one might describe as the making of a national of a non-national history, a project very close to that of today's scholars of connected history. While their primary preoccupation was world history, and notably Africa within it, their histories also contain a local dimension. Ethiopia Unbound, the book by Kesley for, is as much a work that offer a universal narrative of history as it is a history produced for an African audience. From that perspective, his essay turns the narrating of world history more difficult by reminding us to what extent history, even a history born of migration and exchange on a world scale, remain anchored in indigenous native context and conversation. Thank you.